Awesome. Well, thanks very much to uh, Drew and to Giro Happel for having me down here. It's really cool to be in a kind of engineering place. And um, thanks everyone who came downstairs to see me. And for the rest of you, um, thanks for coming down on this uh, beautiful morning. <laughs> um, I've watched a few of the previous talks, and there's some pretty big boots to fill, so I don't know if I'm quite going to do that. But some of the speakers were sort of talking about kind of what they do and what inspires them. So I guess that's what I'm going to do. Um, and I'm quite lucky because what I do is sort of what inspires me. Um, about five years ago, I was sort of working for a big company called Honda, a motor company. Uh, and then on the side, I kind of just started doing this kind of little science thing. And the more people I met, the more people I sort of got talking to, I don't know, everyone literally from like male models to fashion photographers. And everyone was just really secretly excited by science, but nobody was actually <laughs> kind of saying it. So uh, we started SuperCollider to basically try to bring the two worlds a little bit closer together. And I think that's happened quite a lot over the last five years. Uh, probably nothing to do with us. We've just been kind of luckily there at the right time. Um, but yeah, it's been an amazing five years. So what I thought I'd do this morning, uh, since it's such a rainy, kind of miserable morning, is just to sort of take you guys on a sort of journey through space and time to a certain extent, uh, in our minds at least, um, and just show you kind of some of the stuff we've done over the past five years. It's been really inspiring, uh, from Mars to the Super Collider in Switzerland and France, which gives us our sort of our name, our namesake, this is kind of one of the big inspiring projects that kind of came along the same kind of time we did. Uh, to the Atacama Desert, where they're doing sort of X-ray gamma detection experiments, to the microscopic world of crystals and crystallography, uh, to volcanoes, both on Mars and on Earth. And then, yeah, looking at some of this creative stuff, some of the kind of projects we've come across over the years where people have kind of mixed fun creative stuff with science. This was a fundraiser for the RSPB and for the OWL uh, Trust, I think they're called. This is a girl who made these amazing little sort of cardboard box owl things. Uh, and yeah, just some of the stuff we've done as well. This is an illustration we did about uh, our addiction to air travel, sort of comparing it to uh, white lines, as it were. Uh, but before we get started, we're going to try to play a video. I'm probably going to mess up the whole setup here. But this is a project we did fairly recently, I guess about a year ago, just about. Uh, we came across a filmmaker and a photographer who actually works quite closely with us, and they'd done this kind of time lapse up in the Lake District, which is absolutely beautiful. Um, do we need to? You're on a split screen, so. Cool. I'll let Drew set that up. Uh, and yeah, basically, they went up to the Lake District and did this amazing sort of 360 degree thing with a camera that sort of rotated and took pictures. And uh, we just kind of thought it was amazing in the Lake District, but it would be even more amazing to take it somewhere kind of scientific and kind of look at, had a look at. Uh, where we'd be inspiring, where we could actually afford to go, which is the main thing. Uh, and thanks to EasyJet, we ended up on the island of La Palma in the Canary Islands, which is home to the European Northern Observatory. Uh, I don't know if you've seen lots of stuff on TV recently about the European Southern Observatory uh, and about ALMA, which is the new telescope down there. This is the kind of northern version of that. So here we are on La Palma. This is uh, John Hooper and Mike Maloney. Uh, and this is called 24 Hours Here. The, um, those last couple of shots was where we sort of spent the kind of three days up on top of these mountains. They kind of 
We sort of showed up in this kind of, you know, Spanish kind of scientific institution on the top of this mountain and sort of very broken Spanish kind of explained what we were there to do and they had absolutely no prior notice or anything. So they just ended up basically giving us the keys to this telescope and saying, oh, you can just put your stuff in there. And it was this state-of-the-art telescope in 1986, which has since kind of lain vacant. Uh, so yeah, that was um, 24 hours of La Palma. The bit where I said the f camera fell down was because in the middle of the night, sort of the wind got insanely strong and it was like a sort of a spike. You can actually see on the yearly weather thing, it was the one night that winds got up to 100 and something miles an hour and blew the whole camera rig over. So you're supposed to see the whole sunrise and go from there. Uh, but yeah, in an ideal world, that is basically what we would do. Uh, one of the probes, again, the little rover before it sort of unfolds. It's all very transformative, it's very kind of compact, and these things close up and gets delivered to the planet. They're now sending a new one. I think it's launching very soon, actually. I need to check up on it. But uh, it's about the size of an SUV. So this is like the kind of mini version. They're now sending this giant sort of, you know, uh, massive one, basically. They've obviously been incredibly successful. They've seen all sorts of amazing geological features, early evidence of water, which we're now starting to see more and more of. They've taken some amazing shots. I'll show you one at the end. But this is the Earth, as seen from Mars, which is quite amazing. Just for those of you at the back, it's that tiny <coughs> the little pixel there. It's a bit like the Carl Sagan sort of pale blue dot uh, photograph. I don't know if you've seen. Um, Uh, this was one of our early kind of success stories that we sort of did with SuperCollider. We kind of sent this out as a sort of special alert. We were like, oh my god, should we email people when they haven't asked to be emailed? And we sort of sent it anyways and sort of said, hey, everyone, there's this comet that suddenly became visible over London. And um, people from this fashion magazine all ran upstairs, apparently, to the roof and kind of went and saw it. And we had all these, calls, all these emails like, oh my god, we saw this comet. That's crazy. Thanks so much. So <laughs> yeah, we're hoping another one comes back. So that was five years ago. We're now sort of still waiting and stuff. We do put a lot of random kind of stuff in. Uh, this was an Italian design festival, I think. Uh, another spacecraft, you'll see a lot of these with kind of foil and stuff on them. This was at the Design Museum, Luigi Colani, who makes amazing sort of weird floating houses. And for those of you into cars, Ferraris. Uh, this is the RSPB out in Rain and Marshes. If you ever go to Paris on the Eurostar now, you go past here. That's the Eurostar track. So look for it on the right. It's a beautiful place. It's all, the reason we featured it is it's all eco-friendly. It's uh, highly insulated and there's heat exchange systems and yeah it's just a very nice example of sort of nature and sustainability coming together as is the micro compact home which is featured in a book back to the super collider uh, future cars super collider super collider lots of this stuff this is obviously where the uh, world wide web was invented at CERN to kind of power some of the uh, systems and networks but again just a beautiful kind of shot of the kind of technology behind the science I suppose as it were uh, I'll just kind of skip through. It's the last, one of the last remaining tortoises on the Galapagos Islands. Some beautiful shots of Mars, which you don't usually see, in a kind of infrared, ultraviolet. You can see a little bit of atmosphere there, a little tenuous kind of bit of air hanging on. Uh, this was a, well, art exhibition at the ICA, all about the sort of future and different people's takes on it. I think that one's hot chip. Uh, this is when we went to Japan with uh, the aforementioned car company. We got a little bit of time free to go check out some stuff. This was the uh, capsule building that was supposed to be all interchangeable and each capsule was supposed to be taken out every year and cleaned and replaced. And as you can see, it never really happened. <laughs> it kind of <laughs> got a bit grubby and people were complaining and it's like, yeah, no wonder, it's you know, full of garbage. So I think it's actually been torn down now, which is sad. Uh, this is an artist called Brandon Bellinger who sort of mixes science and art. He sort of leads these expeditions out to kind of look at frogs and amphibians and stuff. Uh, this was a cool thing he did in Brooklyn or in Queens, I think where he basically went to the fish market every week uh, <coughs> and saw what was on sale and took detailed notes and basically monitored kind of fish populations through what you could buy at Queen's Market in New York, which is quite interesting. <coughs> uh, it's a DIY spaceship launched a few years ago by Bigelow Aerospace. It's a sort of inflatable space station. They just kind of went ahead and built themselves, which is pretty amazing. So it's the Dreamliner, I don't know if you saw a couple uh, last week, two weeks ago. It had its first flight. This was when it was still in the... Uh, uh, in the making. It's just a carbon fibre kind of shell. Uh, Daft Punk released a movie about robots, so we wrote about robots. This was one that kind of crawls around the space station on three arms that they're developing. It's a bit sort of like the Canada arm, but kind of robotic. And of course, we had to throw in Transformers. Uh, some early Virgin Galactic stuff, some fashion models, some space people, more fashion models. We started working with illustrators. These are guys called Nuvu from Leeds. Uh, we've now actually done a book with them that's just come out all about sort of crystals and um, I don't know, it's kind of science but 
kind of through illustration and not too heavy. Uh, looking at illustration again, these were like a few books that were sort of re-released. Uh, the Intelligent Woman's Guide to Atomic Radiation, one particular <laughs> standout. Uh, this is interesting. We're quite sort of fascinated by sort of retro kind of science-y kind of things. I don't know if you noticed, we don't really have much about sort of iPads and technology and stuff, but we really like the sort of old-school stuff. This was kind of the Arecibo message which was sent into space, I think in the 70s, from Puerto Rico, and it basically contains all kinds of crazy information about, you know, us and where we live. That's the Earth, the third kind of planet from the sun, and a model of the dish that sent it, which you remember was uh, featured in James Bond. It's the big sort of giant one. Uh, we do cover a lot of space stuff because we're sort of boys and we like space. But we try to mix it up with illustrations, rockets, more space. This is in Antarctica, a kind of uh, astronomical observatory, uh, just because it's so quiet and clean and the air is so free of radio waves down there. It's a great place to sort of do science. Kind of skip through and let the pictures tell the story a bit. This is a crocheted reef, a sort of uh, hyperbolic reef, they call it. They sort of made it all out of different bits and bobs. There's some really beautiful old science stuff before they had computers and they had to get artists to paint all the kind of spaceships and ideas and stuff. I mean, I don't know why it's got this kind of weird fade in the background, but it's just, you know, absolutely beautiful. You wouldn't get that nowadays, going the wrong way. Uh, we try not to cover like any sort of military kind of stuff because, I don't know, it's just kind of feels a bit wrong, but occasionally there's stuff that's just so artistic and amazing that this is the Joint Strike Fighter, the F-35, and just, I don't know why it's all sort of color taped and color coded and stuff. It's probably for like a very good reason, but it just looks quite amazing, despite it, the fact it kills people. Uh, this is the thing we do with the RSPB, kind of looking at endangered birds and different kind of patterns of flights and stuff. Uh, this is familiar to all of us who have our little table uh, today. Uh, this was our visit to the actual Super Collider. We finally kind of got to go and see the uh, Large Hadron Collider at CERN. So we took a few pictures in between, kind of staring at big, huge stuff. Uh, it is incredible. If you get a chance to go, even just the facility above ground, um, it's all sort of closed off, obviously, at the moment. But I think in between maintenance, they reopen it and stuff. So if you go to France or Switzerland, definitely check into CERN and see if you can go have a look. Uh, it's just a crazy place. I mean, we ended up picking up, you know, pictures of kind of, I don't know, probably the garage door opener and stuff that wasn't very scientific, but it was a kind of weird sort of place. And then we get to go down and walk around all the things. This was the open day, so you can see it was uh, <laughs> made by uh, scientists. And this was a French, uh, a French school group who were kind of had other things on their mind <laughs> apart from, weren't that interested in the science aspect of it. Uh, I think mega projects are sort of fascinating in general. This is the Three Gorges Dam in China, uh, photographed, I think, by Edward Bratinsky, but yeah, just an amazing scale of things. Uh, it's a beach cleanup in Baltimore, in case you're wondering. Uh, Edwin Collins and his bird pictures, uh, Indian schools making spacecraft, space food from Korea. This is one interesting thing. They've started doing sort of like kimchi and green tea and different sort of foods for different astronauts, so every sort of country is now starting to tr experiment with different cuisines to make you feel more at home, which is amazing. So one thing we're going to try to do, if you guys are all around, is try to do like a space food dinner at some point in the next year, kind of get as much space food as we can and get somebody to cook it, try to make it appetizing. <laughs> uh, I'll sort of keep flicking, because I know time's ticking away. some old Apollo stuff. We're quite sort of obsessed with Apollo and some of the moon missions and some of the art that came out of that as well. Uh, this is Aerogel. I don't know if anyone's heard of the Institute of Making or the um, Materials Library. It's this lady here, Zoe Lachlan. If you have a look after, you can get her name. They're just basically opening up a new exhibition space down at Somerset House. They've been kind of stuffed away in this little kind of amazing scientific basement at uh, King's College. And we went to visit them and they have a sample of this stuff. And it's absolutely amazing. It's the world's lightest solid, so you hold it in your hand and it's just absolutely nothing. And yet it can withstand, as you can see, it can withstand the heat of a blowtorch and support cr you know, crazy amounts of weight and stuff like that. So if you get a chance, I think they're opening the next couple of weeks, so get her details and have a look online. And uh, it's definitely going to be worth a visit. They've got all sorts of amazing stuff. Uh, I myself am Gallium today, and we've just ordered some off the internet. 
and uh, you hold it in your hand and it basically just melts in your hand. The melting temperature is so low and then you sort of pour it back off your hand and it turns back into metal. So they have all sorts of amazing fun stuff like that. It's going to be kind of like being back in school again, I reckon. <coughs> This was uh, a solar village in Germany, an amazing architect called um, Dieter Rolf, I think his name is, sorry. But he made this amazing house back in the kind of 70s and it looks like one of these concepts that's never going to get built. And then sure enough, he sort of went and built it and lives in it and helps design other ones. I did warn you there'd be a lot of spacecraft. Uh, this is a fusion plant in outside of San Francisco. It's a sort of experimental fusion reactor, so basically firing massive amounts of lasers which then come together into an ultra-dense kind of sphere. And this is actually quite an amazing sort of, they've had a breakthrough in the past year that means that they might actually be able to get sort of fusion energy going, which is, you know, a sort of super clean, super safe version of nuclear energy. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead quite a lot now. This was the last, one of the last shuttle flights. And what was interesting is they had to have one on standby to sort of rescue the first one if anything went wrong. So <laughs> of all the kind of moments in the kind of, you know, 21st century, I think this feels like one of the most futuristic, having sort of two giant spaceships ready to go. And uh, so I think that's the first and last time it happened. I think this one was going out to fix the Hubble Space Telescope. So it was going so far into space that it wouldn't be able to evacuate to the space station. So they had to have two. So yeah, just an amazing kind of image that we'll never see again, really. Uh, United Visual Artists doing crazy stuff in the forest. We seem to be stuck. There we go. Uh, this was a little animation we did a while back. We sort of decided we were sort of tired of just writing about people. We wanted to kind of start creating ideas, which we haven't done as much as we would have liked to. But we kind of had this idea that we've sort of thought of this kind of self-replicating solar cell, these little things that you could drop into a desert and it would you know, absorb enough energy until it had enough energy to reproduce. And then it would sort of build three of itself and they'd build two of themselves. And they'd put these little wires out into the sand and yeah, sure enough, eventually you'd have this huge kilometer array of solar panels delivering clean energy to the desert. And we kind of thought, oh, it's a bit of a stupid idea, that's never going to happen. And then a few years later, this guy, I don't know why he's wearing a hat, but went out into the <laughs> desert and has built this amazing machine that basically uses solar power to melt sand and to be able to build glass out of stuff like that. So yeah, it's something hopefully that maybe will happen. Um, this is Titan, amazing, sort of fascinating place. The moon of Saturn that has an atmosphere and rain. And uh, yeah, just incredible. I'll skip forward a little bit. This is uh, one of the early designs for NASA's uh, spacesuit. So Neil Armstrong would have been wearing that if it had gone ahead when they went to the moon, but they weren't. Uh, this is Werner von Braun, the rocket designer. What I love about this picture is that I've had to actually cut sort of a <laughs> hole in the ceiling for that. They kind of, when they got to here, they never sort of envisaged how far things were going to go. Uh, more stuff, more stuff. And we're just about the end here. Uh, this is a bit more recent. I don't know if anyone's been watching Frozen Planet on the BBC. Absolutely amazing. I was a bit kind of wasn't sure whether the Arctic was going to be that interesting, but I mean, I don't know if anyone saw this episode. It was absolutely incredible. A kind of river running off the glacier and then just disappearing down into the ice. Uh, and then finally, to go back to the very, very beginning, I think it's probably one of my favorite images of the past five years. This is. Uh, sunset on Mars as captured by one of the rovers. You can see the sun's like slightly different from what you'd see here. It's a little bit smaller. But yeah, just the fact that it's an actual real photograph is just, to me, mind-blowing. Seeing the mountains in the distance and stuff like that. Uh, I thought I'd quickly do a quick thing about what we've kind of learned recently. Uh, in the past couple of days, we've been doing a sort of article about asteroids because there's a big one about to come past the Earth. And we interviewed somebody yesterday from a place called Space Guard which is out in Wales, and it's based on this guy and his wife who he decided in, I think, the 80s that he wasn't sort of convinced about the UK response to asteroids. So he sort of built his own observatory out in Wales and sort of funds it himself, and he assured me that we'd be fine. But this asteroid's going to pass between... Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he said, it's quite a bit larger than usual, but we'll be all right. It's, I think it's four, <laughs> 400 metres wide. So yeah, it's quite a big one. It's going to pass closer than the moon is to Earth. Uh, and meanwhile, NASA have a a spacecraft way out in space called Dawn, which is looking at this asteroid called Vesta. So this was at the furthest approach when it was kind of starting to get closer and closer. And now it's gradually zoomed in to the point where it's orbiting around Vesta and just starting to capture these amazing images of the surface. And this is the first time we've actually been to the asteroid field and stopped. You know, the asteroid field is sort of between Mars and Jupiter. And we've been to it before, kind of on our way through to other places, I guess a bit like Swindon, you just don't really stop, you kind of keep, <laughs> keep going. But this time they've actually stopped and it's going to orbit this one for about a year and then head off to an even bigger one 
called Ceres, which is the biggest asteroid in the asteroid field. And it's starting to make these amazing sort of topographical maps of the surface. This is the South Pole. It's a mountain that's three times the height of Everest. It's just, you know, it's a crazy place. And they're doing their NASA stuff. They're making maps and doing colors and things like that. So yeah, thanks very much. Uh, if you want more stuff, you can subscribe or follow us. And <laughs> So does any of your work distill down to kind of younger people who, far as saying, are kind of not coming through the system with the same kind of interest and passion for sciences as perhaps we, we did? Yeah. I suppose the uh, short answer is no, because we haven't had any criminal uh, record background checks yet. So <laughs> we're not actually allowed to work with kids yet. Yeah, we're not allowed anywhere near them. Um, but we, are, you know, that's, we have been approached a few times to do certain projects, um, to run things for kids and stuff. So it's something we're looking into. What I'm sort of interested in is the age that, I don't know about you, but the age that I sort of got turned off science. I think it's this very critical time where, you know, when I was little, I was you know, a little science kid, and I went to like, you know, science on Sundays in Toronto, back in Canada. We went to this little like, museum and did science stuff. It was all really, really fun. And then you get to a certain point where kind of, you know, being a music journalist or, I don't know, whatever else becomes really interesting. And science becomes very hard at the same time. So suddenly everyone's doing all this cool stuff and going to parties and science is suddenly very hard and doesn't look very appealing. And I think that's where we lose a lot of people. I think a lot of our events, we kind of get people coming up and saying, oh, that's great. It's like, you know, being a kid again and learning all this amazing stuff. So I think it's going to be quite critical to find that kind of cutoff point. And I mean, there's obviously a sort of tough uh, age point to sort of engage, you know, they're kind of not allowed to come to bars and stuff yet, and yeah, that's where we do a lot of our stuff, is kind of, you know, evenings and mornings like this and stuff. So it is a kind of, yeah, it is a crucial but tricky one. But I think that's probably something we'll kind of, kind of look to move towards and stuff. There's a very good example, there's a magazine called Live, which is down in South London, and it's run by a company called Livity, and they're basically set up as not-for-profit, and they basically run this sort of magazine for kids who kind of come in and make this magazine all about grime and stuff. And they just find it, you know, it's been so successful, they're going to South Africa now and doing that from there. So we've been talking to them about maybe trying to do something sciencey with them, which could be, yeah, a future avenue. <coughs> so if you had a blank check, is there one project that you would want to kind of emerge yourself, immerse yourself in? Depends how blank a check it is, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, we'd love to, you know, maybe go photograph the, you know, send a fashion photographer up into space to photograph the probe that's photographing the asteroid. That would be incredible. Or to go, you know, set up our own uh, observatory on the far side of the moon, maybe a radio observatory to kind of observe space. I think if we had unlimited funding, though, we probably wouldn't do anything ourselves. We'd probably find a really cool science project that wasn't getting funding and give it to them and sort of let them do something amazing. Uh, but yeah, I think if we had more, uh, yeah, more funding, more money, if I won the lottery, I think what we do is kind of just send creative people to scientific places. I think that's where it's really interesting to kind of, um, there's an amazing uh, space launch center down in French Guiana. That's the European Space Center. That's where they launch their rockets. If you're closer to the equator, you get more of a kind of boost up into space. Uh, and it's kind of set in this bizarre kind of world of tropical jungles and there's a little town, like a tiny town, that basically closes down every time they launch a rocket, some of the roads have to close. And yeah, it would just be amazing to sort of send artists and photographers out there to kind of capture that world. And everyone sort of takes pictures of the rockets and the launch pads, which look the same, but I'd love to see what it looks like in the town. You know, do people stop or do they just keep going about their business? You know, does anyone care if a rocket launch is there anymore? So I think, yeah, it's basically we'd mix creative and science people a lot more if we could. So uh, how do you find stories to cover? What are your research methods? Uh, the challenge is more finding, well, figuring out what not to write about, because there's just so much stuff, it's crazy. Especially when we were doing, um, most of that comes from when we were doing the weekly, when we were sort of working other jobs, and we just did it once a week. And it was really hard to kind of narrow it down to one uh, thing every week. Um, but nowadays, I mean, what's so great about science, as opposed to a lot of the other disciplines, is that everything's open source and free. And you know, nowadays, if you go on Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons, there's just you know, so many amazing images that used to be so hard to find. And um, a lot of the agencies have got much better about their kind of image searches and stuff. Like we used to have a whole set of bookmarks just for NASA. We had like all different bookmarks of where to find specific images and where to get insp you know, inspiration from. And now it's all just one big huge website. It's all cross-referenced and stuff. So yeah, it's really if you just kind of you know, start looking at just one thing leads to the other. And uh, yeah, we now find it's almost a bit of overload. You know, so much, you know, so much stuff. And you know, some of the magazines we used to work for uh, are now running their own science things, which are you know incredible, and they have full-time staff, and they're kind of you know doing way more than we can. You know, Vice magazine, uh, who we do a lot of stuff for, have launched a website called Motherboard.tv, which again, is a lot of it is very tech and wiredy kind of stuff. 
but they have amazing science and every couple of days they've got some incredible story up there. So do you find big personality clashes between scientists and creatives? The scientists probably being quite left brain and the creatives being quite right brain. Uh, we've had, yeah, a few instances of differences <laughs> <laughs> over the years, but I think in general they do sort of, yeah, there is a kind of common kind of thing. It's kind of, you know, as a scientist you sort of have to create your own sort of, you know, experiment or create your own mission or, you know, a lot of these, you know, some of the space stuff is basically someone who has an idea and they have to see it through just like the rest of us. Like if you're going to put together a magazine, it's the same as doing a space probe. You have to convince people that your rock out in space is the most important rock to go to and you've got to sort of sell it. And a lot of it is kind of quite similar. We're finding like some of the marketing and scientists having to sort of make their own <laughs> websites and do the public engagement thing. So there is that kind of uh, similarity. On the other hand, there are some yeah, clashes as well. I find the weirdest thing is when we have speakers and stuff, I think creative people and scientists think sort of respect people who just do what they kind of do. And the only problem that we get is when scientists try to be creative or try to be comedians and it just really doesn't work. But I think if you just stand up and say what your experiment is or what you're doing or you know, why you're particularly interested in you know, uh, substrata geology in the Fijian peninsula, then yeah, people will just kind of listen and you know, really like it and stuff. So, but yeah, no, I think there are definitely the similarities as well. So I've got a question that kind of comes from that point. Uh, what are the, I mean, have you had any opportunities to actually work more closely with scientists on their communication to kind of get this, you know, like a greater synergy between kind of creative and the way they communicate and, and scientists and the way they kind of put this amazing stuff together? We haven't yet. We've been trying to figure out a really nice way of like emailing people to tell them their website's completely rubbish and <laughs> offering them, you know, <laughs> offering to redo it and stuff. Um, but it's something we've looked into getting funding for, and it's quite hard to do because it's quite so sort of subjective of what is a good website and what isn't, and what is good design and things like that. So the publication we did, uh, we launched in September, was kind of our first sort of foray into looking at that kind of world of kind of how design and science work together. Uh, and looking at different case studies of kind of how things can be sort of improved and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, because the trick is with science stuff as well, a lot of it just has to work and it has to be kind of very clear and easy to read and stuff. And there's even programs that sort of design, you know, scientific papers. I didn't know this. Um, but you basically put your paper in and it makes it, you know, lays it all out in this kind of international standard and stuff. So it's kind of things you can't really mess with kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think there's definitely huge room for kind of, yeah, exploring mm -hmm. that more. What was your path into doing this? Uh, it was kind of like a sharp left turn, really. I was kind of, um, <laughs> uh, I was working as a music journalist and more like, yeah, sort of fashion culture kind of magazines. I worked at Vice magazine back in Montreal and then I had a short, well, long lived but short lived after I got there, a publication called Sleaze Nation, which is a bit like The Face. Uh, and then from there, Days to Confuse and a few magazines like that. And it was actually with the current editor of Days to Confuse that we started talking about doing Sip Collider as a project and um, just realizing that it was amazing science not sort of being treated in the same way as you know, kind of art and fashion, which to be fair, I mean, fashion, you know, you can come out with crazy stuff on the catwalk and nobody laughs, it's all very serious. And multi-million pound business. Whereas science, I don't know, it just seems all these guys in lab coats trying to make it zany and blowing stuff up. And I don't know, it's just not treating, I think what we sort of found is like, found it annoying that science isn't treated with the same respect as other kind of creative disciplines like art and fashion. So it was trying to sort of elevate it to that kind of state that we got into. So really, yeah, no training. I've just kind of stumbled into it and bumbled along really and picked things up and stuff. So I'm still dreading the moment where I'm going to get sort of completely taken apart in a scientific conference and, you know, someone's going to ask me a really easy question like, what is a positron? And I'm just going to be like, no. So, yeah. But we're always very honest. We don't know anything. We've actually just um, we've got a girl helping us out now who's done a degree in physics and a degree in art. So I can now sort of direct our questions to her, which is, <laughs> which is good. But yeah, I just think nowadays it's like, I think people, you know, shouldn't be worried about sort of exploring different sort of fields and yeah, just diving in and asking questions, I think is the best way to do it. So we've seen a lot of science inspiring art and, and culture kind of more generally. Do you think we'll ever see the flip side where we see artists inspiring approaches to scientific problems? Or have you seen any examples of it? Yeah, it's a tricky one. I mean, it's a better question for the Arts Catalyst because that's their real specialty and we kind of tried to steer clear of it because they've been you know, doing that for a few years, well, 10 plus years, I think now. And that's really their kind of, yeah, their kind of thing. Um, we've tried to be more about sort of other creative disciplines like design and music and kind of not so much the art. Um, but yeah, I think there is definitely a case to be made. I mean, people like Brandon Ballinger, people who are sort of artist scientists really mixing it up. And I think some of the stuff they've done um, has been kind of started as art and then became actual science and then became these really scientific studies and stuff. And I think bringing that sort of artistic point of view. Um, and there's the other case, which is again a bit more technological, is that 
people find it very hard to kind of imagine scientific ideas and new inventions unless they can kind of see it. And I've read sort of like theories about sort of self-fulfilling prophecies that you know we will have a sort of time machine and we will have a you know teleportation door because it's something that we can imagine and draw and put in TV shows and stuff. And if you look at early Star Trek or 2001: Space Odyssey, in fact, they've got sort of actual iPads on the you know space station. And it's this weird kind of would that have happened if it wasn't for those kind of movies and this kind of you know crossing over? And basically, yeah, things coming from the artistic world which then inspire real advances. Um, whereas some of the kind of I, I don't know sort of more far out, weird kind of science stuff that's really hard to kind of popularize, maybe never gets funded or never kind of captures people's imaginations because it's just so kind of inconceivable and weird and they don't have any kind of artistic or cultural reference point for it. Um, so yeah, but I don't know, in terms of like hardcore scientific research, I don't know whether it kind of is ever going to, you know, there's always sort of problems and things that need to be explored and whether art kind of influences it or not, we'll have to see, I guess. Cool. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks very it was much. marvellous. Thank you. Thank you.